to uh, the February, we're in February meeting of the uh, ones of CCG board. Um, so we will do uh, some of the formalities. So we've got apologies from Kathy Kerr and uh, Michael Lane, and we are expecting Andrew Neal to be here. So I'm sure it's just a transport issue. Um, any declarations of interest uh, other than those we have on our register? Who mm -hmm. want to flag anything? Just declare, I'm now employed by NHSC. Thank you. Uh, we'll do that in a minute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Um, and we are chorus. So, yes, I do have um, so a couple of things I wanted to uh, flag. So, first of all, uh, so Sandra, indeed, um, you sort of left and come back really quickly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, Sandra officially left the CCG over a week ago, but um, as always, she wanted to come back to tidy up loose ends and do a thorough job. So, this is her final board meeting, um, having already started in her new role. Um, so, Sandra's been with the CCG from the beginning, and in the PCT before that, 2009, I think you started in Moyes. With. Um, so, Sandra, you've been instrumental uh, in supporting our CCG to establish robust governance arrangements and to focus on quality of patient care. Um, and we've got sound systems which will um, live beyond you and put us in a, in a, in a good um, state to be able to continue that work into the future. So, I want to thank you on behalf of the board for everything that you've done and um, wish you all the best of luck in your new role. Thank you. Um, and we have just a couple of other announcements to make um, regarding the uh, lay membership of our CCG. Um, so we have um, been reappointing um, to roles and appointing to new roles. Um, so uh, we have reappointed Stephen Hickey as our lay member for governance and Carol Varlam as our lay member for PPI. And we'll be having um, a new lay member for governance joining the board to strengthen our, um, uh, for finance to join the board to strengthen our um, finance arrangements. And that will be Chris Savory, who currently works as an associate lay member in the CCG, so is familiar with the territory. Um, and he'll be joining us officially from the 1st of April. Okay, shall we do the minutes of 14th of December? Uh, anything on accuracy, first of all? Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think there are any matters arising uh, that haven't been dealt with already. Nothing that I missed. Everybody happy with those? Thank you very much. Um, and what I thought I would do now is, um, uh, as a courtesy to our guests who today have come uh, in part to present a petition to us, is beginning so that um, uh, so that we can understand what the issues are regarding that. So, um, who would, would would you like to? I don't know who is going to present us with a petition. Oh, hello. So, um, do, I mean, we have had the petition, um, we've seen the signatures, so we've, we're in receipt of that in the CCG, but if you just want to explain what it's about so people understand. Yes. It's working. Is this working? Yes, that, that's all okay. right, yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Yes, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, people on NHS public, which uh, the, the local uh, people are concerned about what's happening in the NHS. Now, the, now, now the issue about the blood testing services, as, as you know, uh, it is that it's, it's now being restricted at St George's Hospital that there's availability for uh, patients of local GPs in Wandsworth, uh, certainly in Tooting. Uh, and, and I know that, uh, having discussed it with other people, that there's uh, all sorts of uh, uh, rationales about uh, re responding to the um, uh, um, uh, inspection and, and, and issues around standards, but. Uh, the key issue for us is not that, it is about the context in which this is actually a, uh, a, a reduction in choices uh, and a cut in service to local people uh, a, 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 in the context of a broad range of cuts which I know that you, you, are, discu you, you are, are discussing in terms of this uh, STP uh, in a, 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 and this is your plans, the SDP intention to reduce outpatient services at the children's hospital by 20%. Um, I don't think uh, uh, that we should get um, 
uh, caught up in the, in the specific detail. I think the issue is about making changes, <coughs> reducing choice at a time uh, in the context of a broad range of cuts. And what we're asking the CCG to do is to stand up and say, you are here in the interests of ones with patients. You are here to defend the uh, services uh, uh, to, 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 to ones with residents. And, uh, and, and in, in doing so, you need to protect the, uh, uh, the provision of, uh, of uh, uh, in this case, blood testing services to St George's, but more broadly, you need to protect the role of St George's as a provider of, uh, of, a, of a comprehensive range of outpatient services to, um, to the local population. And uh, if, if there isn't sufficient, uh, uh, if that doesn't fit with the budget that's been set, we're asking you to stand up and say you cannot commission effective services for your local population without the right funding to do so. What uh, we want, as a campaigning group concerned with the um, uh, uh, protecting the, the uh, a comprehensive and publicly funded and public, publicly provided health service in, in this area. We want to work with you as the commissioners uh, and the decision makers about local services to protect those services. It's disappointing that what we see uh, is you uh, giving uh, clinical uh, rationales to what are actually cuts and we would like you to stand up with us and say no, we cannot provide an effective healthcare service to our population uh, unless uh, we're the, uh, the right funding is provided and we will continue to commission those services as though that funding is provided and that's what we're asking you to do. Thank you. Okay. So, um so th thank you very much for the petition and so it, we recognise it reflects a high degree of interest in the commissioning decisions of the CCG and... Uh, sorry, could, could, I, I'm a bit, my ears are a bit sorry. popped today, could you speak yeah, more so, clearly? So I, we recognise that what you're doing represents a high degree of interest in the commissioning decisions of the CCG and we welcome the opportunity to uh, understand the views of, of people and patients in Wandsworth. Um, in this instance, although I recognise the kind of context of the issues um, that you generally are interested in, I think it is important for local people that we describe the issues around the blood testing service because people will have concerns about that specific issue. Um, so we, we took a decision several years ago to commission routine blood testing services from general practices in the community. Um, and while there was recently a request from St George's to assist the CCG to assist in reducing activity for some services on the, on the Tooting site, the drive to commission more services closer to patients' homes is, is well known in Wandsworth CCG strategy. Um, and a review of the provision of phlebotomy services was therefore you know, welcomed by the CCG. Um, so instead of having to travel to the St George's site, patients can access blood test testing services in 36 of our 42 practices now, and this has happened over several years. Um, and patients who can't access services from their own practice have got a number of options. So they can access it at Queen Mary's Hospital and St John's Therapy Centre, um, where the service is provided by St George's Trust. Um, they can book an appointment at a, a local abuddy practice, um, who will offer the services to patients on their behalf um, and any patient can access a walk-in phlebotomy service every weekday at Rocklebank practice and also Ballon Park surgery and Bedford Hill family practice which is also available on Saturdays. So there's actually a, a vastly increased choice for patients who need to have a blood test. Um, patients get a blood test request form which tells them about all those different choices that they have um, and for housebound patients, we've got a local domiciliary phlebotomy service, so those patients are you know, much better catered for than they have been in the past. Um, and most of the practices, you can get free transport and um, accessible public transport, free parking, and um, you know, people can generally get to somewhere relatively close. Um, people who need a blood test as part of their range of investigations, which have been arranged by St George's Hospital, still can have their blood tested on the tooting site, um, or if they're in emergency attendance there, of course. Um, 
So we're not planning to reinstate the blood testing service at St George's um, because this one site, it, it, it fits with our plans that we were trying to achieve anyway. But we're going to continue to keep things under review because you know this has happened relatively recently and we'll continue to want feedback from patients on, on how things are working. So that's specifically on the phlebotomy service. Um, so, and we are discussing our... Um, the sustainability and transformation plan later today on the agenda so I suggest that we could raise issues in open space regarding that on the more general issues if that's alright with you ok so thank you thank you for the petition we appreciate it um, if we could proceed now with the agenda um, so we're going to talk about um, our clinical focus area this week this month which is um, on urgent care um, so got a paper on that and Dr. Ramon Grohl who is our urgent care clinical lead and um, Rebecca Welburn who is the um, responsible officer for the uh, project. So kicking off Rebecca? Yeah. Thank you. Okay so we're doing, going to do this in a two part. Uh, I'll just introduce the paper really and just talk a bit about our vision and also our sort of delivery model which is set out on page three of the report. Um, a lot of work's happened over the last um, six months to look at our urgent care pathway. I think everybody recognises the problems with the pathways that exist now in terms of it is quite a confused pathway with lots of access. Sorry, problems. Rebecca, you might just want to pause. And I think there's quite a lot of um, movement people leaving. So I just want to... Some people arriving. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. quite confused in terms of patient access. It's difficult for people to know where they should access urgent care and there is um, a risk really of people ending up in the A&E department because they have difficulty knowing how to access the primary care appointments. If they phone 111, previously 111 has been a, a non-clinical model which has meant it hasn't been able to sort of manage much risk in terms of keeping people away from A&E. So a lot of the advice ends up with going to Amy, um, you know, not, not always the best place for their care. So our vision really is to pull urgent care right now. We think most of it actually should be delivered. Some of that's around self-management, people having better access to advice about how to manage day-to-day -day, um, health issues for themselves and their families. Uh, some of it's um, primarily about opening up same day access in primary care so that people are clearer about their ability to get an appointment within four hours in Wandsworth. So that's by their practice and also looking at how we link the 111 system back to practice um, um, appointments so that people, wherever people access as their first point, they get directed to primary care where that's appropriate. At the moment, we know that 30% of people that end up at the um, emergency, emergency department at St George's actually have primary care needs. We think that's too high, so we need to make sure that we can take as much of that uh, activity back to where it belongs in primary care. And I think GPs in Wandsworth are really clear that that's where they feel that care should be managed. Um, so that's our first principle around which everything else in the model um, it is, it's based. We've also recognised that there's people with ongoing care needs and if we get their planned care right, the unplanned care elements will reduce. So um, access to planned care appointments is also increasing in Wandsworth and things that we've put in place like the enhanced care pathway for older frail uh, people in Wandsworth is, is about sort of managing ongoing care in a more proactive way to reduce the urgent episodes. We know those urgent episodes will still happen, so our rapid response services have increased. So we've got rapid response clinics that we're uh, developing at QMH um, and GP visits within two hours um, at home so that we can assess need and manage things out of hospital where possible. So if we go to the diagram on page three, I think this is a really... We're going to use the new improved 
111 and out of hours service to make sure that it's a truly integrated pathway that whether you need urgent care in hours or out of hours you'll get the same clear messages and the same access to services wherever you might live in Wandsworth. So the, the green boxes at the top represent the ongoing care and self-management, which we feel it's really important to get right if we're going to reduce the need for urgent care that's managed both in primary care and at the hospital. So um, this, the same day bookable appointments and the four hour bookable appointments are developments that we've had new funding to support this year. So there's a pilot that's being worked up at the moment that uh, I know Andy has more detail of. Um, which means that across Wandsworth there will be more appointments for people between 8 and 8 and at weekends. So much more of our urgent care activity can be managed as standard primary care with less need to manage it outside of that um, system. The out of our service in its new form is much more linked in with primary care, so we want the... the uh, and at the beginning of uh, um, out of hours to be managed in a more sort of um, meaningful way across that boundary. This, is, this should all be part of the same services part as, as far as patients see it and we need to manage those relationships behind the scenes to make sure that happens. Uh, at the moment we've got three urgent care access points in Wandsworth. Um, not all of those uh, comply with the new urgent care centre requirements, so we've got work to do to review both which sites we need for urgent care. Once we've got primary care fully up and running, how much urgent care capacity do we need on top of that? And the new urgent care requirements mean that that needs to be open 16 <coughs> hours a day, and it needs to have diag diagnostic access 16 hours a day. So there's a piece of work going on with our partners across South West London to look at where where those sites should be and obviously people don't always um, comply with borders between boroughs so we need to work with our close neighbours to make sure that we're citing places that make sense in terms of patient um, journeys rather than just you know having our own plan um, without reference to that. In the other box next to the urgent care centres is the AAA pathway and that's very much the, the ongoing management of people that we know have got complex needs and who will need urgent care at fairly regular intervals. So we want to be much better at offering that without people needing to go to St George's. So that's using rapid response visits. It's having um, routine and urgent clinics at QMH um, for older people so that we can make sure that they get the right diagnostics and the right care package at home and they only go to hospital if there's actually a need for that. And then in the, in the bottom three boxes we've got the hospital based uh, emergency care elements so obviously we're working with our 999 provider to make sure that they've got all access to all alternative pathways if people phone 999 so that they only take people to hospital if that's the best option. At the front door of A&E, we want to make sure the streaming's right, so we're using our new ambulatory emergency care pathways better. These are pathways that manage urgent needs without need for an admission. So things that would previously have meant that somebody was admitted to hospital, for instance, suspected DVT would be an example, uh, now can be managed um, with, with outpatients needing to be admitted and using outpatient follow-up appointments instead of um, overnight stays. Um, and then obviously the ED department, the, the whole aim of this is that becomes, you know, that's optimised for what it needs to be there for and um, we want to support St George's to deliver uh, urgent care standards uh, and timely access um, by taking other activities to where it can be best dealt with. And I know Ruben's got some case studies that I think will sort of bring this to life in terms of how it will impact the patients in Wandsworth. Thank you. Um, so yes, I thought it might be worth considering some sort of theoretical patient journeys and describe the life experience within the current system and then hoping to trust how it might possibly fare within our future model. And these examples are based on some common sort of patient experiences that we see quite often. So the first patient is a young professional develops near pain at work, he rarely sees his GP, even the level of pain is on. Here is triage, then sent to the urgent care centre. So after a wait, he's finally seen and treated. So he may actually commonly be in this department for several hours. 
In addition to this, it's also by CGB in a few days to follow. So in Wandsworth, we have done some work with patients that commonly um, attend the ED department. And amongst many things, one particular factor is the lack of confidence in being able to see a healthcare professional, um, professional quickly, especially one's GP. But the problem with this example is that this is encouraging the use of the ED department or urgent care centre for problems that would be best managed within primary care. So in our vision, this type of patient would be triaged, uh, but would be consistently redirected to their own GP where possible. We have developed and are continuing to develop um, a system where we can ensure that patients, if deemed necessary, can be seen within four hours within primary care. And it may be also possible in the future that the ED department itself may have, have the capability of direct, uh, direct booking. If this similar patient called 111, we would also expect that they be um, triaged back to see their GP. But we also anticipate that soon the integrated urgent care service will be able to directly book into their own GP service. And also, the GP service may be able to manage this patient in a variety of ways. It might be a telephone consult, remote consultation, or even triaging to another healthcare professional such as uh, an emergency nurse practitioner. Either way, I think we agree that there's no doubt that seeing this patient within, within their own GP surgery uh, with access to their notes is the most safe and appropriate environment. Another common example would be um, an elderly frail patient. I had one like this last week. Um, this is where the carer has noticed that the, the patient's becoming more generally on a week, more weak and sort of less mobile. The patient may be visited by their GP and no obvious cause identified. Um, but in the meantime, the carer is finding it more difficult to cope. And it's thought the patient's no longer safe to remain at home. Ideally, the GP would like to do a few basic investigations to ensure there's nothing grossly wrong. Um, but unfortunately, currently, the most common outcome for this type of patient would be that they would be admitted to the hospital to an acute bed. So our vision would be that such patients would be considered for alternative care pathways, such as the acute emissions avoidance pathway, Queen Mary's. Um, and here, patients can be seen quickly and assessed uh, with a geriatrician-led service. Um, importantly, they, they do have access to diagnostics uh, and also the ability to admit the patient if necessary to a step-up bed. They can receive a package of rehabilitation as well as coordinate any investigations that might be required. An even better scenario is that this same patient is identified earlier within, within the community uh, as being at risk of admission, and then they can be referred to newer services like the Rapid Access Clinic, again at Queen Mary's, which can, can again undertake various tests and coordinate um, appointments and arrange outpatient rehabilitation if necessary. And the third and final quite common example is the parent that collects the child from school. They're told that the child's been unwell and has temperature. Um, the parent contacts 111 when they get home. Uh, that they're, they're triaged by 111 to call their GP. So they call the GP, leave a message. By the time the GP gets back to them, it's after 6 o'clock, and they're unable to get to the surgery in time. Uh, so eventually, unfortunately, this patient ends up going to the ED department. <coughs> so the problem with this common example is that, first and foremost, the parent is, ha has to contact a variety of different services, uh, but also encourages the assumption that the ED department is the best option for this patient. And actually, in the future, this parent will probably take their parent, uh, the, the, the child straight there. So our model, hopefully, will look slightly different. So if that same patient calls 111, then they will again be triaged to see their own GP. However, we anticipate in this situation, they will have the capability of direct booking into GP practice, but more importantly, up until 8 p.m. in 7 p.m. <coughs> so we are allowing GP practices either individually to open up later or collaborate with neighboring GP practices to ensure that they have um, uh, opening hours until 8 p.m. <clears throat> so either way, in this situation, the patient is seen by a GP, and most importantly, they're seen with it with um, the electronic records available. So we hope uh, that some of these changes will improve patient journeys, but in particular, we hope that the patients will be seen in a safer and more appropriate environment. Um, and we do think that one of the key enablers um, um, of streamlining uh, delivery of urgent care is reducing the burden of primary care manageable problems that are seen within these services. Um, we do also recognise the challenges regarding capacity within primary care. However, we do feel that there are efficiencies within the system um, that need to be realised. Uh, in particular, better interoperability between services can um, uh, enable more effective use of current resources and capacity. Um, so, thank you, and we'll welcome any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, shall we? Uh Let's open discussion. Stephen. Um, I was slightly unclear about the distinction of primary care between the same day bookable eight hours and the four hours bookable. 
and, and, and who decides you know, if I'm phoning it, my, my child's ill or something, who decides you know, on a four hour or an eight hour? And I'm, I'm going to have that one back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I think there's a, an important principle here around patient expectations, which is that it's no longer good enough to offer them an appointment the same day, because same day could mean, you know, you ring at 8 o'clock, you don't get seen for another 10 or potentially 11 or 12 hours or so. And we know, particularly in ones with highly transient population, um, the peak of any attendance is actually between 11 a.m. Um, and then around again about 3 p.m. when sort of schools kick out, and, you know, kids not feeling very well. So what we've done, what we've worked with, I think we're probably about the first CCG to actually try this, and we're aiming to go live on the 1st of March um, with our practices, is to say that if a patient rings in and they have a clinical need, then they can be offered an appointment within four hours. Um, now that's not to say they want an appointment within four hours, but it's about offering that appointment within four hours. It could also be the same day as well. So to an extent, this is to say that Whilst we have historically always promoted same-day appointments, we're now going beyond that and saying actually we recognise that for some patients they have to ensure that wherever possible that patients are able to access an appointment within their GP practice within a four-hour period. But who decides? Yeah, so is it the receptionist who interprets that I need in four hours or I can wait till... It's uh, so that brings me down to um, obviously the clinical chair as well, so clinical assessment in the practice. But that's clearly a practice by practice discussion, but principally you would expect that would be a clinical process. Yeah. So it will, it will vary from practice to practice, yeah. I think. Um, but introducing this system, I think, will cause practices to relook at how they do that triage inevitably. Yeah. Thank you very much for an interesting program. Let's hope it works. Um, I think the most useful thing in this whole thing is the urgent care center movement. And I think having real clarity, having known sites that are open from 8 to 12 or whatever it is, um, and really <coughs> clear publicity about that widespread, what's there, how long the typical wait is to be seen in an urgent care center and what they can do and what they can't do and lots of publicity about that so the population is absolutely clear about where to go so if you have a broken arm or whatever or you think you do do i go to an urgent care center and there's i know there's one at queen mary's or there's one in battersea or whatever or do i have to go to george's or someplace else and real, that's been the most confusing thing about walking centers and minor injury, whatever, some lack of clarity about who's open when, who can do what, and it's just easier to go to A&E. And I think real comms program on that is going to have the greatest mileage. In so Sister, uh, the challenge with that, I think, for us is to ensure that what we move is people who would have gone inappropriately to ED yeah. into yeah. urgent care and not yeah. people who should have gone to their GP into the urgent care centre because it's right, right shiny you're building or right. whatever. But, so, um, yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, Rebecca, did you want to say something on that? Yeah, just yeah. that we, you know, we, we have realised that the, the variety of sort of names and services that have built up over the years are very confusing. And people don't know until they turn up whether it's nurse led or it's GP led, whether they've got diagnostics there. Yeah. Well, we can't expect people to use that kind of system well. So it's all about reducing the numbers of services so that people clearly understand the branding and that when they go to that service, they'll know exactly what can be offered. And I think, again, it's working with our one on one system to make sure that people are navigating to the right part of the system. And also, I think, you know, the, the difficult bit of this is that the ED department has to be better at saying to people you're in the wrong place, you know? because, you know, at the moment, the, the culture is that once you're at the ED department, they'll manage your care because that's what they're there to do. And, um, you know, so it's about us knowing that we've got the right bits in place to, to support all those care needs so that people feel they can take the risk of redirecting people. Mm. Okay. Uh, is it on that, Andy, or is it different than mine? Mine is on that. Is it like I was actually at George's A and E a few weeks ago, somebody else, and um, they were turning people away. Um, it's quite a fierce triage nurse <laughs> 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 who who very 
places possible <laughs> way. So it, it, it is happening. At least the day I was there. It's about clinical risk management, isn't it, for yeah. professionals, I think. Lucy. So it was a, a similar point that Carol's beautifully made, I, I think, but to put it into some wider context, which I think is <laughs> a cultural shift and relates to, to Ruben's first example of a working age adult who chooses to, to go to ED rather than engage with a GP. In your example, that um, working age adult was registered with the GP, but we know there is an issue in one of people who don't register or um, with, with our very transient population, making sure that people are aware of their GP services. So I think the point you made about a marketing campaign is a really good one, but right at the centre of that should be um, the, the importance of primary care, yeah. registering with your, with your GP, understanding the services and how you access them, so that the people who are accessing the other tiers of service here are, are the right ones for the right for those kind of services. Uh, Andy. Um, so on the point of the uh, urgent care centre, so I think we have inherited in Wandsworth the minor injuries unit, which is St George's, uh, and the GP-led health centre. Um, we all offer kind of unique services, which their own local population know and love. Uh, but I think it is about same to future model. These urgent care centres are over and above what you would expect primary care to look like. So this is not, you know, we should not be using urgent care centres because you can't get one with your GP. This is about enhanced services. So that's why I'm quite encouraging of the work we've done in Queen Mary's recently around um, emissions avoidance. So using the facilities that are available to say, right, well, actually, let's look at you on the day let's try and prevent an omission from occurring, which we then will know, uh, which we then will know, tip into an acute omission and cost a lot of money and be very inconveniencing for patients as well. So I think it's about first and foremost getting that uh, rock rise in primary care, which includes self-management and community resilience within that as well, making sure that we offer additional appointments and appointments when patients want those, want those. Uh, and then it really is around looking at a consistent offering of urgent care that's over and above a walk-in type offering, which also promotes, where possible, the element of mission avoidance. And then using the 111, the integrated urgent care system, to kind of really support and gate, gatekeep all of these different processes as well. And then only then um, you've got your ED issue, sort of your last option uh, when you clinically need it. Mm, okay. Yeah, just wanted to add that it's really welcome the, the greater clarity for patients. It's very confusing for patients to know where to go. Um, I don't expect me, this is slightly off tangent. In terms of self management, um, uh, I just wonder whether there's any education program or link with our schools about it, uh, you know, teaching on, on self management. Uh, I don't expect you to answer that because it's not within the remit of this, but maybe it's something in the future with our greater collaboration with the council on education programs for people to, because it's very confusing if you don't know where to go, what, what to do for certain things. Okay, so That's something we should pick up on, thank yeah. you. Um, can I just, just make a point about um, the language that we use? So we're starting to use the terms urgent care, emergency care, planned care, and I think we've got to work out how to describe those things to people. I think that will help in the system generally, really. Stephen. Um, the paper is, I think, silent on money in all this. <laughs> Um, and I wondered if you could say something about that. I'm thinking, you know, in, in, in live running, should this be neutral, more expensive, cheaper? A and B, is there an investment cost to getting making these changes? And if so, I mean, so the whole financial dimension isn't actually mentioned here. So I think there's an element of some of the services. It's about recycling money that we're using, say, for a uh, a walk-in clinic that you know might become an urgent care centre. So there's some sort of reinvestment opportunity. With primary care, I think we've all recognised that to get primary care to the level that we want it to be, we need to invest. And there's some new pots of money this year. The you know the pilot money for the um, eight to eight primary care is obviously very welcome, but it's not going to take us as far as we probably need to go. And I think probably want to say a bit more about that. Um, I think within the STP, you know, there are savings related to reducing um, A and E attendances. So that you know that is seen as a saving. That's not necessarily money that. We work through as we understand what the demand is at each level. My feeling is that we need to get primary care to the right level of capacity and everything else sort of works around that because what we don't want to do is build lots of urgent care centres to, to compensate for the fact that we haven't invested enough in primary care. That would be a mistake as far as I can see. Um, yeah, so the work is structured so that we 
get a good grounding in primary care, really. <coughs> what we don't want to do is start to look at urgent care centres, different ones, different models, and actually find that it's more of a white elephant because it's really about the message of getting back to your primary care, your general practice. It is whilst well, I can see you within that four-hour period where you need it as well. Um, just finally on the money, so we have secured uh, an additional uh, just under £1 million, um, which is new money coming into the CCG to support us with offering um, these additional appointments in primary care, such as they're within four hours uh, and the hubs as well. Sorry, is that extra money a one-off? And recurrent. Oh, it's recurrent. Mm -hmm. And is it sufficient to cover the costs on an ongoing basis? Yes, so, yes, so it is. So it's recurrent for now. So it's covering the costs. Recurrent for now. <laughs> <laughs> that means it's not recurrent no, twice. It's, <laughs> it's non recurrent twice, isn't it? Yeah, and then it's it becomes an update. So <laughs> yeah. It's recurrent. So it will cover off um, about an additional 40 to 50,000 appointments. We're obviously working with our GP federation around how we monitor, how we look at the usage of these, uh, this additional capacity as well. And then obviously we'll bring it back for our internal governance around the impact that that's having, both in terms of uh, patient surveys, but also any uh, A&E or urgent care centre reductions as well. Mm -hmm. And we just monitor on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, a couple of things actually draw, drawing together for some earlier questions and comments. So um, I had a similar question. It, it wasn't specific to the money, but in terms of so where where are we now? I suppose against this mm -hmm. kind of development plan. So if we sign up for the model. Uh, what, what's your view on where we are against it now and how long and the kind of milestones for those? And, uh, and I guess the, the board could, at the end of this, um, request an implementation plan to, to come back uh, in due course. And just back to the, um, the really important thing about um, communication with the public and patients as it gets implemented. I was thinking actually about a step before that. So what's been the level of patient engagement in the design of this model? And just thinking about the petition that was presented mm -hmm. to us earlier, there's a very good yes. example yes. of a very well-meaning transformational change program, you know, to deploy services differently into primary care and all that. There is a danger if we don't bring public and patients across our communities with us on this, we will get to the point of implementing something where the degree of understanding and engagement in, in that development is on. So, so if it hasn't been done, really strong recommendation, we need to invest in some serious you know, patient public engagement that is more than communication about the new model, it's something about getting people engaged in the design of this. Uh, you would like to just want to respond to you. So, so the first bit, the question about where I'm <coughs> I think the primary care work is progressing well in terms of the 8 to 8 model. I've got concerns, you know, because it's private money that we, you know, that we won't be able to go fast enough to say this is the model, you know, so I think that's a conversation that we need to have about how we brand that for people. We don't want it to seem like, well, we're trying this out and then we'll have change again. So we have to be careful with that. I think, um, I mean, I, I would ask Andy uh, to sort of speak to, to the engagement um, that's happened around the primary care model. I think the urgent care work is just kicking off across South West London. It's part of the SNP work stream about, um, you know, looking at our urgent care system and making sure we've got the right sites in the right place. And I think it's really important, as you say, that that's done in partnership with our local communities. And that work hasn't started, so there's an opportunity to do that. So uh, it's worth also mentioning that um, in terms of the integrated urgent care work, that's had quite considerable amounts of sort of patient involvement across South West London. Mm -hmm. and, and equally with the work around the AAA pathway and the old people's frailty model, we've had quite quite considerable engagement in that work. But I think there's something about bringing people into it as a whole program. I think that's yeah. you know the point we need to. Um, I'm going to carry on with Stephen on this. It's, me, it's on the same thing. I mean, in another life, I was involved in channel shift stuff, trying to get people to shift from paper to online services. And one of the things we learned there was, A, we had to do a huge amount of um, customer engagement yeah. before in the planning phase, which is what you're in now, and that's mm -hmm. absolutely essential. But slightly to my surprise, I didn't realise this, actually having gone live, was where the work really started, yep. because the take-up was so disappointing. I mean, it was good at one level, but disappointing in another. And and the lesson I took from it was that this engagement process, in a sense, only starts when the thing goes live. And and I think that's, a, that's different from consultation in the, as the NHS normally sees it, which is kind of in the planning phase. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's some seriously heavy lifting, including in that particular example, 
very detailed, very detailed micro mm. analysis of the people who didn't do what they were supposed to do, why they hadn't, what the blockages were, what the issues were, lots of which emerged that people, we, you know, we hadn't thought of in advance, frankly, etc., etc. So I think when there's to think about this sort of shifting behaviour as a, a permanent, you know, for practical purposes, of, you know, several years after it's gone live, very actively, not just in the planning phase. Mm -hmm. Jamie, how do you say? Yeah, um, mm. yeah, Jamie, go on. I'm still thinking about this one. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Um, just to um, thank Graham for bringing up that point. Um, I think there has been public engagement in South West London of urgent care. I think I've been involved in a couple of sessions myself, but it's not really all that's impressive. But I, I think we really need it in Wandsworth. Mm -hmm. We need a Wandsworth yeah. public yeah. engagement with urgent care. It hasn't happened yet, but I look forward to it. Mm -hmm. okay. Can I suggest that the implementation plan includes uh, some uh, monitoring of, of the activity and tracking the changes so we, you know, we're able to see how, how the landscape is changing. And building on Steve's point around the channel shift, I'm also involved in some of the shifting towards self-help on the electronic. And what I've also learned is that you need to be agile about what you do. You need to be prepared to change your plans. Not necessarily this is the plan. You know, we want to continuously get people to change. So we learn along, and along the way, you know, throughout the way, and we change what we do. Um, so uh, this is slightly negative, but just kind of, so on, it's really mean, it, it's very, very close to looking at this fantastic. Uh, but it is an element of a new services, and there is a, just a kind of a dual phrase here, you increase supply, you increase demand. Mm -hmm. So we need to really, this is why tracking the activity is so important, and being prepared to change some direction if you think this is just generating more demand, people are going to the GP, to a &E, to the mm -hmm. urgent care centre, etc. rather than instead of. Mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, so just sort of um, chopping this up a little bit into a few different parts, so the primary care bits, which is the increased um, access to general practice to four-hour appointments. Uh, they're due to go live from the 1st of March. Um, there is a detailed implementation plan behind that and also looking at precisely what is it that we can monitor, measure and work out its effectiveness. Um, and I think you're right, Stephen, that will evolve actually. I think it will evolve probably fairly quickly because then we in the practice will then start to work out well, what is it that the patients are asking for and what's that actual need going to be like. And one of the things we're also investing in is other forms of technology to support practices. So it's not simply about just you know another tens of thousands more appointment, more GP appointments, but it's about different appointment types accessing your GP in a different way. Some people want to access it perhaps just a quick bit of web advice for something very simple. Other people just need to see a GP. So it's it's about being kind of attuned to different access models to general practice as well. I think the bit about the I think we're doing this in a step fashion because right we need to get primary care right first and we need to invest in our own primary, our own general practice, um, then what we're going to be looking at, I think, is the urgent care sense model, so the sort of the, the level two, which will then say, so for those patients who can't, don't need to go to general practice because they have enhanced needs, what is it that they actually do need across Wandsworth? And that's when we'll start to look, um, probably in, in line with South of London in the next six or 12 months around, uh, so is it an MIU type service, is it a, a GP led type service, or is it something else that meets the new national specifications? Um, and I think what we haven't done is obviously then done the engagement, if you like, for the entire model. So I think that's a very fair challenge, and I think we can have those conversations about how we push that through locality groups and patient groups as well. So I think it's, it is evolving. We're kind of constantly learning from it. Um, but we have got to the primary care from the 1st of March, and we have, for the last five months now, got, I think, a much more effective sort of 111 system, which is increasingly bringing in clinicians, so it's less of a court handling service and more of a, a clinical hub and advisory service as well, and that's the key development from the last time as well. So things are moving. I think probably one thing from the board is that we need, or at some level in the organisation, some kind of grip of the implementation plan so we kind of keep true to this vision, which is absolutely correct. We just recognise it happens in different levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, OK. Um, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to uh, wrap that up a bit. So, um, so clearly much of this is driven by national requirements, such as the um, London Facility Standard, of it which are, are there um, at a national level um, and of course our own STP which it drives the shape of it as well. But we've got 
quite a significant, powerful local nuance in this, I think, which other people haven't described quite as much, which is we think the best thing for the patient is to go to their GP, who knows them and who has their medical record. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, there are other things which, you know, in some clinical scenarios are much more um, uh, appropriate, for example, direct to ED. But the other stuff is needs more definition and that's what we're trying to do here is work out if, if that's not the right place for you at your GP where are you going to go how can we service that uh, that need so um, within the resources that we have available which is because these are all more expensive once you go beyond your GP practice they're, they're all more expensive so um, I think all of this really needs to be underpinned by our tier zero, which you know is our code for patient self-management, um, resilient communities, empowered people who can look after their own healthcare. And of course, we've got a paper later on where we're sort of discussing um, that very subject. So, um, so this is this is an enormous a plan with enormous implications, really. And I think the vision is right. I would really, really support it. Um, we will have elements of the implementation plan in other <coughs> committees and meetings, won't we? Because the Emergency Care Delivery Board will be looking at this, the Primary Care Committee will be looking at this, and there will be bits of it all over the place. But I think our job as, as a board is to, like we've looked at what the vision and the overarching plan is, is to see, is the implementation plan proceeding? So rather than bringing one plan back soon, I, what I think is there's probably the plans are in place to do this, but can we draw them together to bring back to this board with progress, maybe in, I don't know, six months when the GP things are really getting underway, um, and have an understanding of, of what's changing already um, and what more we need to do, and to look at what the resources are to... Now, I don't know if that's that's probably not the same piece of work, but, you know, I kind of look to you two so we understand what are we spending now on urgent care in all its different places and have, so the board can understand what is the new model proposing that we spend and what's evolving as we go along. So it's a, it's a massive project, isn't it? Um, and we've got to take it in chunks, but I do think we need to keep this overarching view of it as well. Um, and just the final thing to say is, yeah, on the PPI around this, I think that's really important that we get the input to the plans developing and then as we're going along, help people to understand, you know, where... So it wasn't really a summary, was it? It was more of an expansion. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> good. Thank you. Um, so, what are we doing here? We're so we're reviewing and um, uh, and supporting and agreeing with the direction of travel, and we've asked for a few additional things as well. So, thank you both very much. And there's massive amounts of work going on there. Okay, so uh, we're now um, also Sandra Swan song, really, isn't it? <laughs> so we're going on. To uh, it's going to be. A I'm going to end on the mark. Oh, good. <laughs> well, good. Let's go. <laughs> So, uh, this is our performance report. Um, it's a slightly different focus in this month's report because the timing of how this has appeared in the year, I think, has given us an opportunity to spend a bit more time looking forward to what we think the year-end position is going to be for 16-17, plus to give the board um, a view on what the 17-19 operating plan targets are going to be. So, the paper begins by describing the indicators we expect to achieve in the year, so diagnostics, some of the cancer waiting time targets, although not all, and some of the mental health indicators, especially around IAP. So as, as the board will be aware, this the year as a whole has been has had highs and lows, some good points and some areas of struggle, so I'm, I'm hoping the board won't be surprised by the predictions we're making for year end. Um, the targets we won't achieve are around NHS constitutional measures uh, will be... Um, some of the cancer targets, A and E, uh, and 18 weeks. So I think it might be worth us spending a bit more time on those three areas in particular. So the, board take, the paper takes you through this in a bit more detail. Uh, thinking about A and E to begin with, while St George's is not going to achieve the 95% national target, they have most of the year targets and we think there is a chance they will still achieve that at year end despite some difficulties around the Christmas period. Uh, but it's possibly... So, Sandra, the, and the relevance of that is if they achieve their STF target? So, um, trusts have been given some more achievable targets. Uh, uh, so, uh, reputationally, it's very important that they achieve their STF. I can't remember if there was money attached to it. 
there is, yes. Uh, so imp important from that perspective. Um, it, it probably is just worth reflecting that St George's performance has held up quite well all year, particularly around Christmas, where they did better than many of the other neighbouring trusts. Uh, so I think we have some assurance that some of the work they've been doing around a &E improvements is having an effect. Moving on to 18 weeks, which has been a, a more long-standing and more difficult pro problem, really. Um, I won't rehearse all the issues that the board is familiar with, uh, but what we've done in the in the report is pull out in a bit more detail the detailed work plan that they're doing around recovery. Uh, so we've described a bit around uh, you know some of the issues that they're having and the focus of the work stream, which is around operational grip, data quality, booking and scheduling, clinical governance. So, for example, a reduction in wait times for um, clinical letters being typed, cancellations are coming down, and so on. Uh, but we, this is going to be a 12-month-plus programme of work, and we'll uh, continue to monitor it through IGC with some regular updates to board. Um, Cancer is the next area that we just wanted to flag. Uh, cancer performance has been variable throughout the year and there are some absolute risk areas around two week waits and 62 day waits in particular. Uh, but South West London does have a fairly robust approach to trying to deal with this. There's a Cancer System Leadership Forum which is uh, chaired by a CCG CEO uh, and attended, it does have some CCG attendance but critically provide very good engagement from providers and they've been doing some very good pieces of work around diagnostics so far where they've done some demand and capacity modelling and looked at streamlining specific pathways and now their attention is really focused on this ITT issue which we know from our performance reports uh, represents quite a number of the breaches that are, are being reported so there are some inter-trust uh, <coughs> standards uh, for timeliness, but they're also looking at things like being more explicit about the workup that needs to be done before a patient is transferred and so on. So we hope that that will have some, uh, we'll, we'll start to see some improvements from that work stream over the next few months. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about s this year's performance. Should I take any questions on that before I move on yeah, to 1718? Yes, um, in the um, uh, statutory, the, 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 the constitution targets, yes. you've talked primarily about St George's. I wasn't clear about the CCG's overall performance. Yes. I mean, things like 95, you know, the, the four hour, for example. Yeah. Are we going to fail that on a CCG wide basis, as seen from George's? Yes, we are. For, for a &E we are. Uh, St George's, as you know, is the majority of our performance in that one, although not the entirety. Some of yeah. it is driven by Chell West, which in past years has had very strong performance in a &E, but not so much this year. So we'll fail that altogether. RTT, we are reporting that we are achieving RTT, but that's basically because St George's are not reporting any data. So if, you, if we were reporting St George's data, we almost certainly would fail that, and I would judge that we were overall considered not achieving it despite the kind of technical green because such a big proportion of our data is missing. Cancer is a bit variable for each indicator I have to say, so I couldn't give you a prediction yeah. for each indicator no. to be I think I mean I think it's very important that throughout these Clearly, right, very uh, properly, a really strong book on George's, but we need to distinguish mm -hmm. between that and the overall position. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else on last year? Okay. So moving on to 1719, we um, recently submitted our operating plan trajectories. Uh, of course, the NHS constitution measures will continue as expected. So what we focused on here is the new measures. Um, so I'll take you through them. Improving access for children and young people's mental health services. This is an access indicator very similar to the IAPT access indicator, but for a new area of care for, not a new area of care, but a new, uh, new area that we're reporting. Uh, so the target here is to achieve 32% of children and young people with a diagnosable mental health condition receiving treatment. Um, and our current performance is around 24%. Uh, I'll keep going unless people stop me. I, I'm going to skip the next one and come back to it. Personal health budgets is the next indicator I want to talk about. And that this, uh, this is a reflection of a uh, very ambitious national programme to increase significantly the number of patients who have um, a personal health budget. And our, uh, so we have a proportion of that target locally 
which is that by uh, quarter four 1819, we will be at a rate of 102 uh, personal health budgets per 100,000 um, registered population. And again, as I said, that's a reflection of a national indicator that all uh, commissioners are being asked to achieve. The next one I'll skip and come back to, uh, and just to briefly mention, uh, we've got an extended access target which we've for GPs that we've talked about as part of the urgent care, so, so that's reflected here. The two new and most high-risk indicators to flag are e-referrals, so... So for people who've been around for a while, you'll be familiar with this indicator, but it ha has renewed focus and importance on a national level. So the aspiration is that by quarter three, 17, 18, we will be at 80% of all first outpatients booked via e-referral. And by quarter three, uh, 18, 19, we'll be at 100%. Uh, just to give you some context, our current performance is around about 23% and has been for about that level for years really. Uh, so a huge challenge. We did uh, flag that we were concerned about achievement of this one and tried to submit a more, uh, we felt, achievable trajectory but uh, had a very clear steer that this is the national expectation for all commissioners. Um, so this is going to be a significant programme of work to try and improve our levels both working in primary care around some of the technical aspects, but more so working with our providers about how slots are released on the Choose the Book system and are available for us to book. The second area I wanted to flag... Sorry, just stop me, sorry. So, <coughs> just to challenge ourselves on that one, I know it, it leads and feels like a steep climb, but there are CCGs that are achieving this in partnership with their local trust. So, have we done the piece about, so what will it take to... So, achieve it and, and try and bring it into reality in terms of an aspiration. So I, I think that's an important challenge, Graham. I do think we need to be much more active in sharing learning with partners. And we've started to have conversations at South West London level, or South West London performance is not great. Um, but we need to extend that. My understanding, though, is of the really high performing CCGs across London at least, they use um, referral management centres. And that then really supports their ability to achieve the target. But but that doesn't mean that there aren't other measures mm -hmm. that we can take, and I think we will need to do that. In all honesty, this hasn't been very high priority for the CCG, so mm -hmm. I think we haven't explored all options. Yeah. Sorry, on this, I mean, can you just give a heads up from our perspective? What's in it for us? Why you know why? You know, I realise national policy and all that stuff, but do we actually believe this is a genuinely a useful thing, either in terms of patient care and or in terms of efficiency? So, I mean, it might be useful to get the GP's perspective on it. From um, There are absolutely advantages to the e-referral system for our providers, so they don't have pieces of paper floating around and massive admin uh, departments dealing yeah. with those pieces of paper. So so there is some efficiency there, but I'm sure GP colleagues... And that's, that's what we found. So we, yeah. we sent someone on a recce into the booking office at St George's, and there's 20 people over there dealing with paper yeah. and two people dealing with choosing books. So there's obvious efficiencies there. I think there are efficiencies for patients. It is much better to walk out of your GP surgery with your appointment, knowing that your GP knows who you're going to see and when, and there's no doubt about when you have to attend. So it reduces DNAs, it reduces confusion. It, we can't do it unless the slots are there. Yeah. Um, the last indicator I wanted to flag were children waiting more than 18 weeks for a wheelchair. So as you can see here, the numbers for us are tiny, so we're reporting about six at the moment. Uh, so we've extrapolated out for the next two years. So trying to hit a 100% target on such There are also some data issues. need to do a bit of work with community services over the next year about how we tighten that up to make it a bit more um, robust. So those are the main changes in the 1719 um, indicator set. We've just added at the end of the paper our assessments for PPI at both our collective and our individual duty which were recently reported back as both being good uh, and we've explained some of the reasoning behind that outcome so it's just useful for the board to be aware because I don't think that's been reported formally to board before. Um, and 
the, our performance will continue to be uh, monitored in the next forthcoming year as we are now through both delivery group and IGC and then reported to the board at regular intervals. Mm. Thanks, Ms. Sandra. Thank you very much. I think that was a really good paper. Um, anything to add or consider? Sorry, again, it's a very naive question. The wheelchair thing, are these bespoke <laughs> wheelchairs? Yes, yes, I believe so. Because I mean, 18 weeks strikes me as astonishingly long, actually. I mean, you know, why? <laughs> yeah. Oh, you mean, yeah, it's generous. I mean, so my understanding is no, that wheelchairs not, not need modification for individual children, but I didn't. Anyway, I, I'm not going to say any more. Why, why are we actually, talking 18 weeks rather than two weeks, yeah, is my yeah, question. Yeah. Mm. Very good question. I don't have experience of children's wheelchairs, but I have a lot of experience of wheelchairs. Yeah. And the service is all over the place, and it's got different players yeah. and different yeah. people doing it. Yeah. And it depends on personal observation, very variable quality of people working yeah. in the service. And that's very yeah. unfair to say. But latch on to somebody. I became an expert wheelchair technician myself mm -hmm. um, by default. Um, it's a real, it, the whole thing needs somebody pulling it together and taking charge. And, and I think part of, the, part of the point of having it uh, as a target is that it just shines a spotlight on it, so I think it's been yeah. probably an area that hasn't had very much focus funding or oversight, so by reporting it, yeah. we will start to see Absolutely, it's again. a good thing, isn't it? It's it a good is. thing, yeah, absolutely. Good. Anything else to say on that? Sandra, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Um, what shall we do? Shall we have a little break now before we go into the next bit? Would that be right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Come on then. Five minutes then. Thank you. The team transformation plan. So it's uh, Rebecca again. Um, and really, I think so. Rebecca, you've got a presentation, haven't you? And um, Lucy, I don't know if you're. Are you Should wanting to, to do an intro? Yeah. yeah. So I'm um, delighted to be able to introduce I think will be a lively debate about the sustainability transformation plan, which was um, published, as you know, in draft in November, uh, where it was submitted to NHS England, and uh, it continues to iterate this, uh, with further development. So within that context, um, the purpose of the report report today is to focus on our local discussions, the plan for the work. What impact do you think there will be um, from the trajectories, the, the outline of the plan for the set in the, the STP, um, how we want to engage with patients? Means for the population of Wandsworth. Um, and I'm very grateful to Rebecca who has um, uh, organised this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, as Lucy said, it's, we're not going to go line by line through the STP today. Everybody here has uh, discussed it, you know, around the board um, in detail as we're developing it. And we do have a whole range of engagement events planned uh, over the coming weeks so that we can uh, discuss it in detail with wider stakeholders. So, really, the purpose today is just to recap on the um, main summary of the plan, which is available now, obviously, on our website and the Council's website for anybody who wants to go back to the full document. Um, we're going to look particularly at what we've delivered so far this year, because this year is... Also, to look then at what the priorities are for the next two years, we've had a two-year contracting round, so our discussions with providers about how we deliver the STP over the next two years. Uh, to also look at what the worsening uh, financial situation means for the assumptions that are set out in the quick plan and what that might mean in terms of the um, ambition of our plans and the speed of delivery. And I think just to... Um, reiterate what Lucy said, that this is a draft document still, so even though um, I, I know people have been uncomfortable with the fact that it wasn't published for a long time, it's now been published, there's lots of conversations that we need to have about the content in the plan, the direction is not a surprising direction, it's, it's all the plans that we've talked about for a long time pulled together across organisational boundaries, which I think is a real benefit. This is a single conversation we're having with local authorities, providers and commissioners for the first time, and that feels like a positive place to be, no matter what challenges are in the system around the money. There's things that we know we need to do differently. Um, and just to 
overview of what's happened today. So, so we, we worked on the STP for submitted it to NHS England in October and were able to publish it for the first time in November. Um, since then there have been a few engagement events in um, Wandsworth and know Nicola met with Health Watch, I've met with Health Watch, we had an e-day presentation, we've been to our thinking partners group, but we know there's a lot more to do and we're working with our communication team at the moment to come up with a much more uh, comprehensive engagement plan for the next few months. Also to say that it's not just about engaging on the overall plan, it's very much the delivery plans that sit within the um, STP. So we talked just now programs that are set out in the plan will need um, a lot of involvement of uh, patients and stakeholders as we go on to look at detailed implementation plans. Um, the next slide just sets out some of the um, some of the uh, involvement that happened during the development of the plan. Um, and then the next slide is, is a, a very quick recap of what the key principles are within the plan. So I think the, the big message is that we can't carry on doing what we're doing now. Um, the services that we're delivering are not making the best use of resources and they're not able to uh, guarantee the quality that people expect from services or maximise outcomes in terms of um, the care we're delivering. So um, we've got to address the quality, the finance and the um, patient outcomes in our plan. And it's, it's really about looking at how we maximise the preventative end of care and the care that we deliver in the community. We can't change hospital care unless we have new models of care delivered in the community. That goes back to the key principles that we just talked about within urgent care and I think that applies to most of the work streams that sit within um, the STP. It's about saying that our hospitals need to be freed up to deliver what they do best, which is acute care. And at the moment, lots of things that are happening in hospital are things that could be delivered much more effectively in community settings with people who've got a, a better ongoing relationship with patients and can work much more in partnership with them. Um, so, in terms of what that... <coughs> what the STP says will need to be delivered to do that. There's um, a key focus on locality teams. These are talked about as localities of uh, 50,000 plus patients, where the, the teams of um, healthcare, voluntary sector workers can start to work more comprehensively together with a, a recognised uh, population that they're serving. So in uh, ones where we've already got four localities, and those elements are very much to the direction of the STP. And um, at the heart of the locality team is primary care, and it's about building the integration and the relationships with, the, with services in the community that can support primary care to deliver a more sort of holistic approach to managing care of patients. At the moment, we've got very separated mental and physical health care. We're doing a lot to try and bring those teams together so that we start to uh, talk to people about all their care needs um, and understand the interplay of different needs in terms of delivering <coughs> good outcomes. Um, I think that's recognised across all parts of the system. And our um, commissioning of the MCP is, a, is, is a, our attempt to say uh, the MCP uh, and the GP Federation as the lead provider for that will be accountable for making sure that integration happens and that we go beyond just saying this is what we should do and we start to be able to deliver that operationally on the ground. We've got to make much better use of new technology. We're starting to do that in Wandsworth um, and this, uh, the example of Kinesis is a good one where we've got um, a huge number of specialties at St George's now where GPs can access advice from a consultant uh, without actually having to refer a patient. So um, that's just one example of where we, sh we should be starting to think about technologies. We talked about e-referrals. We've not been great, as have 
most um, parts of the NHS not been great at actually um, adopting the technologies that we all use in the rest of our lives to deliver good health care. And the best use of acute hospital staff um, across all the sites in um, South West London is not um, possible or even desirable to deliver every service in every hospital. So this is more effectively across the system to make sure that where people need um, specialist support that that's available no matter where you live and that we don't actually spread that resource too thinly. An example of where that's worked well, obviously we all know what happened with stroke services in London, you know, there's more opportunities to work, to work in that kind of way to make sure that every person uh, receives the best outcomes when they present with, um, with, with um, acute uh, illness. And then uh, we've talked a lot in these meetings and elsewhere about working much more closely with the local authority and uh, joining together health and social care responses so that people um, receive uh, better care and better outcomes and we make the best use of our resources together. And on the next slide, just gone through a few areas where ones have made significant progress against these uh, SCP principles. Um, we've just mentioned we've now got a multi-specialty provider. We're probably uh, within the first an organisational um, arrangement that means providers have to work together in an integrated way. There's lots of ways of doing that and we've chosen a sort of lead provider model where we make sure that um, our GP federation are at the heart of that integrated care and will be responsible for making sure that happens across organisational boundaries. Um, talked about kinesis um, being rolled out across all our practices. Uh, we've increased the community workforce in many areas because we recognise until we get that community workforce in place it will be difficult to manage care outside of the hospital. Uh, we've got an example where geriatricians are working in an outreach model with us to deliver our frailty pathway, supporting clinics, uh, rapid cl access clinics and more routine clinics for older people um, away from St George's so that they can um, get care in a, in a more appropriate setting. And also they're going to be, or they already are, involved in the MDT discussions around high-risk complex patients in each locality. And they're going to be working with us on an in-reach into nursing and care home model over next year. So that's really helpful and I think there's much more potential for people, uh, for consultants working in, um, in St George's to work out with community teams. Um, we can't... You know, it's not about getting a whole new workforce, it's about working across boundaries to make best use of those skills. Um, and rapid response has been a huge success in, in Wandsworth and we've got health and social care packages uh, being put in place to prevent hospital admissions which is really starting to show uh, benefits. And also the uh, ambulatory emergency care sequin that we've had with St George's this year has been effective at increasing the number of people who are managed um, for urgent presentations without admissions and that's uh, hugely beneficial for the patients but also it's much better in terms of the flow through the hospital not to use a hospital bed um, where not necessary. And then some of the some of the impacts we're seeing, we have seen a reduction in um, older people being admitted to St George's. Um, St George's have reported noticing that themselves and we've seen from the figures that over 65s are not being admitted as often and when they do get admitted their, uh, their length of stay is less and we're actually um, doing very well in terms of uh, delayed transfers of care compared to most CCGs in London and we think that's because of some of the joint working that we're doing in the community at the front door of St George's and also around um, supporting discharge complex patients. 
been doing a lot of work to set up a complex discharge team which is um, about the community in reach teams working with the discharge coordinators in a more systematic way at St George's and managing a cohort of complex patients to make sure that once they're medically fit they're actually ready to go home rather than waiting around for assessments and um, packages of care. So that's showing good progress and I think we need to sustain that um, position and even continue to improve on it. Um, at a recent uh, off-site meeting uh, of chief executives from all our providers, key priorities for delivery between 17, uh, 2017 and 2019 within the SGP and these are set out here. They're mainly uh, linked to unscheduled care, so they're about developing the locality teams we've talked about. They're making sure that we've got step up and step down care for people uh, to prevent hospital admission and to get them out of hospital quickly uh, after they've uh, been admitted. Ambulatory emergency care, which we've talked about. Um, end of uh, life care planning and um, improved care planning and support for care home residents. And this um, plan, uh, this page shows that we've already got plans in place, either at implementation phase or well advanced in all of those areas. So that this is a sign that we're sort of in line with the, with the principles of the SGP. We're actually, I would say, a ahead in some areas which is positive and that doesn't mean we're going to stop focusing on these areas. We've got um, plans to extend our services further um, this year. So locality teams that are managing um, fair older people will manage bigger cohorts next year. So we'll, we'll start to bring in care of patients with diabetes, uh, care of people who are living in care homes and nursing homes into those MDTs, more involvement of care planning for people with mental health needs to make sure that we're aligning that with physical health needs. Um, we're working very closely with the local authority at the moment to um, set up a single point of assessment for people who need um, what we're calling intermediate care packages, so that's people who need some extra care to stop them going to hospital or to get them out and recovered quickly and we think if we join up that assessment and deliver a more um, integrated package of care we can get people back to full independence quicker and that hopefully will stop people be needing admissions to care homes or needing uh, long-term um, intensive packages of care and obviously it's much better for people that, you know to get to get back to full recovery quickly after ill health We've, we've recently made the decision to extend our end-of-life coordination um, centre and our plan is to embed that into the MCP over the next year. Um, it's a good service and what we're doing this year is just making sure that we can, um, we can measure the impact of that service so that it doesn't become at risk in future. We, we know it's doing good things but we just need to be able to show what impact that's having on people in Monza. And um, we're working with other service London partners to improve uh, mental health crisis response. So, so we feel that we've addressed those priority areas and we'll continue to work in that direction. But the next slide which Neil's going to speak to is about our financial situation and why just looking at those areas is not going to be enough over the next year. Thanks Rebecca. So yes, so this slide really is just showing you the overall financial gap um, that we've got when we take from, and this is for, obviously for South West London, it's not one for the specific, um, and basically says if we do absolutely nothing, we've got a, an £828 million pound gap, and this slide just breaks it down between the CCG challenge, the provider challenge, local authority specialised, and then uh, sort of a fairly small amount for other. So really focusing mainly around what the CCG challenge is and really what does that actually mean for ones with CCG in itself. So just to bear in mind that this is was all done based on the month six forecast out term position. So as Rebecca alluded to, individual positions are worsening. So whilst we're all hitting our financial targets, our underlying recurrent financial position may actually be getting worse and that could be a situation for ones where 
we know that we are supporting some of our financial position with non-recurrent <coughs> spend, so that would need to be made good. That wasn't known at the time when we uh, published these numbers. But just in terms of what it means for Wandsworth for 1719 going forward, the £21 million pound figure that we need, which is the total value of our quit plan, includes the making good of that uh, recurrent position. Now, within the £21 million, pounds, we've got around about £4 million pounds of investments uh, to a transformation. It doesn't feel very much, uh, really, in the grand scheme of things, but that's something that we, we obviously need to work towards. Uh, if there is other money that is available to support that, that's what we will need to work on. So it's really about developing the quick programme and understanding what investments we need to make to ensure that delivery. So within the quick programme as a whole, uh, we've got in the region of £4 million of unidentified quip uh, within that. And in addition to that, we have £6 million of quip which is under development. So that's a lot of the work that, that Rebecca will be moving on to to talk about the actual transformation work. But it's clearly that's where the main focus needs to be had. Um, uh, but at this point in time, and I'll, and I'll be coming on in my uh, uh, finance roundup to talk about the planning round and, and, and what happened there, so that probably sets that into a little more context. Thank you. Thank you. So, what, because of the financial situation and because we've actually been um, fairly ahead of the game in terms of some of the unscheduled opportunities for improving and transforming services, we've started <coughs> to focus more on planned care. Uh, we see that as the biggest opportunity over the next two years. And um, at the moment, we've got relatively few plans for transforming planned care. So this is outpatient activity. It's um, it's people going having planned procedures. So what we are um, doing, rather than sort of looking at small pathway redesigns as, as we have previously, we're working in partnership with St George's and with Merton to look at what our shared um, opportunities are across the system where we can look at an end-to-end -end pathway and see how it could be better delivered um, and part of that is taking outpatient activity out of St George's you know we know there's lots of pressures on St George's uh, in terms of both their estate not being um, able to manage the number of patients using the site but also that they need as a trust to be able to focus on the things that they do best as an acute trust and some things we all know could actually be delivered better by uh, primary and community teams. So it's about identifying those areas and everybody focusing attention on the uh, quite significant uh, sort of culture, behaviour change that it takes to actually move a system of this complexity um, all in the same direction and at the same time. So um, at the moment we're working on identifying what those, we've decided sort of five or six key priority areas over the next two years is probably what's deliverable. So we've been doing work looking at the evidence base of what those opportunities um, should be. This takes on lots of work that's happened with our clinical reference groups previously, lots of patient engagement that we've already done. It's looking at our right care opportunities in terms of where we're spending a lot more than uh, similar CCGs elsewhere. And it's pulling all that information together um, in a programme work, work that we think delivers the best benefit to patients and also in terms of making our <coughs> local health economy work in a sustainable way. So top of the list is diabetes, which has been on our list, to be honest, for several years and has never quite made the shift it needs to do. So we feel this is now the time to get the whole system behind that change. And the diabetes model is well recognised. It's about saying that diabetes is a, a long-term condition. You know, it's, it's interdependent with, with all other health conditions that somebody might have. And the best place for it to be managed is as close as possible to um, the patient's own home in their own community with their GP actively involved and uh, supported by a community team and led by consultants who uh, outreach from the acute trust. So uh, there's a huge um, opportunity for better support for self-management with diabetes 
the people who manage diabetes and the people who live with it every day and having sort of clinics every three or six months has not has been shown not to be effective in actually improving people's outcomes. So this is looking at how we can provide that better level of ongoing support and care for people. Uh, MSK is another big opportunity and that includes orthopaedics and rheumatology. Um, at the moment, uh, people get uh, referred to an acute hospital and, and almost automatically they get onto a surgery track. Surgery is right for some people, but it's not the best outcome for all people. There's lots of other opportunities around uh, pain management, physio, um, and um, we want to make sure that we've got a really comprehensive offer in the community so that when people do need to go for surgery, they go straight to a, a list in a timely way at the acute hospital. Um, in terms of diagnostics, we've got quite good direct access di diagnostics for GPs in ones where we think we can improve those services to provide a bigger range of diagnostics and also extend those to Merton and also look at um, making sure that the reporting of those diagnostics is better so that the, the acute trust can use the uh, images and not have to repeat things where people do need to go on to secondary care. So we think by doing that we can uh, prevent a lot of unnecessary outpatient attendances that were, are really just to get a diagnostic. Um, dermatology, we think the numbers of people presenting with um, dermatolo dermatological conditions will continue to rise. So this is about looking at models to um, manage that demand in a more timely um, way and make sure that our consultants are supported by multidisciplinary teams so that we don't delay people for instance where they need uh, an early view you know of, of something that could uh, is not likely to be harmful but needs you know rapid assessment ENT is about making sure that across South West London we've got the hub and spoke model with um, people be, being seen in the right part of the system at the moment waiting times in ENT are not good and um, the service is not working in, a, in a, a streamlined way for patients. And the last of the opportunities is around multi-specialty clinics. We know that there's people with three, four, five long-term conditions who are spending a lot of their time going back and forward to St George's for outpatient appointments. We're working with uh, consultants at St George's to look at how we might be able to start delivering clinics that um, manage care more holistically where the consultants work together around the patient rather than the patient going separately to see lots of consultants and we think that brings huge benefits potentially to patients. These are all at the very early stage of thinking so um, you, there'll be a, a process you know, of huge engagement around each of those pathways before we finally implement anything. So, um, just, just in terms of next steps, obviously we're going to continue um, to engage on the uh, STP in general, very much start to work on some of the more detailed delivery plans, making sure that we're involving all the key stakeholders locally, uh, working obviously closely with Merton around St George's to deliver some of that. Um, we've set up a transformation programme board, which I think Lisa's going to probably talk about more next month when we, when we talk about the programme. Um, make sure that we're using our resources in a combined way to deliver this quite ambitious programme. Um, and make sure we're working with other CCGs in South West London to have conversations once with our acute hospitals so that we're uh, not duplicating effort and work. Um, and that we'll continue obviously to lead on some of the STP projects for South East London and to engage in um, all of the other ones. So that's just really a sort of recap of where we've got to since we submitted the plan and um, welcome any questions. Rebecca, thank you very much. So quite a lot to talk about really. Um, and we haven't got that much time. <laughs> but we'll start. I'd like to start. Carol. Thank you very much. I think it's been a really interesting presentation, lots of ambition, with huge promise. 
on public and pa uh, patient and public involvement. Clearly, really important. The SDP is going to happen anyway. I think our focus on involvement this year and next could really usefully. to involve the public in developing the detail of plans, and in particular, I would suggest in diabetes. We've got a very active, very articulate diabetes community, uh, deeply involved and knowledgeable. And I think um, co-production with the patient groups in the development of how the service is going to look in the community would really be beneficial on multiple levels. I hope that goes forward. Yeah, thank you. Um, Lucy? So I'm completely involved what Carol said. I think patient and public involvement will be key to all of these areas. But um, I think Rebecca used the term a quite ambitious plan as she was summing up. But it's a hugely ambitious plan. And one of the tensions that we're going to have to manage is our desire to put patients and the public right at the heart of these plans and yes. the way we develop them with what you might politely call the need for speed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because the, the um, uh, scale of transformation, yeah. as we've called it, is, is great. Um, we know that transformation, if you want to do it really well, taking patients and the public with you does take a long time. It takes resources, it takes capacity, people going out and having those, those conversations. And, yeah. um, and we've, got, we've got a pretty good base on which to build, yeah. um, but we're not doing it just in Wandsworth, we're doing it on the CCGs around St George's, where and so we have to move up the speed at a speed together, um, while recognising that the longer it takes us to do it, the higher the, the financial challenge grows. So um, we need to do both. We do. And so we're, we're, the period um, we're engaged in now is an intensive period of planning before we start, you know, get to April 2017 that says how do we get the best out of that tension to both create the savings we need to deliver next year and do it in a way that we think is sustainable, embedded and will make the difference to the population of the world. <coughs> Any more? Good. Yeah. Um, the slide before last about plan care priorities. Um, are they, how have these priorities been? I mean, individually, there is a rationale for each one, but compared to other kind of study, like people are living with cancer and other stuff, mm -hmm. how did we arrive at this list of, of, um, of priorities for, um, for one's one? Um, so, well, from a variety of uh, sources, I, uh, just to say there's other things going on across South East London, you know, there's a big cancer program that we're part of as well. So this is very specifically looking at where Burton, Wandsworth and St George's priorities are aligned. So it doesn't, it doesn't say we stop doing any of the other things that are in the STP. We're committed to the whole STP. This is about a very sort of rapid program of real service change at St George's. Um, can the cancer network is much wider than just us and St George's, so we'll continue to take part in, in that program. So is this the part of the quick program that was mentioned, the four million that's mentioned? So it's the, part yeah, so the quick big chances. So yes, so I mean the STP and Quip overline both, you know, each other to a huge extent now because our opportunities to use resources better are the opportunities that we've described in the STP and our Quip is our local program of the same things that comes out of that STP. So that um, is that a fair description of the same? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, may I just say one more, more point around it? It's just kind of thinking ahead. As you know, many neighboring CCGs and indeed across the country have started to think about rationing and, you know, looking at cutting back some services. And I think in terms of preparing us for any future, you know, uh, consideration of such, we need to make sure that this kind of Um, I wanted to, I mean, firstly, I want to thank you. I think it's a really very clear and very comprehensive report, so and encouraging, actually, as well. So thank you very much indeed. I just wanted to, though, to reinforce, I think, Lucy's point. And it's both a threat and opportunity, I suppose, which is the sort of cliché of the burning platform. And I wanted really to question for Neil, perhaps, but the, 
the, the, the, the financial challenge here, if I've read this right, what you're saying is, look, just a year ahead, um, we've got four million of unidentified crypts. So we've got four million. We don't, we don't know what we're going to, how we're going to say, crudely speak, at the moment. And the six million that we're looking to the areas you're on <coughs> discussing here to save, but that's in the year we're just about to start. Mm -hmm. And you said earlier that there's a lot of work to be done, and quite clearly, I mean that's manifestly true. Mm -hmm. So delivering six million next year is good, is definitely challenging. Um, there's a, another issue I know, I, I suspect, Neil, that is that all of this budgetary numbers is with minimal, um, with minimal reserves. And in the past, we've gone into financial years always with some sort of reserve because in the real world, stuff goes wrong and doesn't happen and so on. But this year, even with those savings, we have, frankly, minimal reserves. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of talking it up, as it were, wearing a sort of finance hat. Um, actually, if we wanted some real reserves in the way we always have done in the past, we'd have looking at sort of what we really want is 14 million, mm -hmm. give or take. Mm -hmm. That is very, that's the gloomy side of it. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's correct, but that's question, my question. Assuming it is correct, roughly, the positive side. Um, is that I do think this is a this is a burning platform, mm. and a lot of the stuff we've been talking about here is about the direction of travel that we have been talking about in Wandsworth for many years, which is very I mean in essence it is about taking stuff out of hospitals and bringing to the community, mm. and and I I kind of feel that that you know <laughs> this is where you know we we really do hit the crunch, mm -hmm. we either have to do it or we don't, and and we have to do it. I, I mean, if, for the financial reasons, at, at pace, and that will be difficult for the reasons that um, you, you've alluded to. And I, I just, I think we just want to crystallise. You know, that, that's where we're at, um, and it really is quite a, it's a major change. This, um, and and kind of, if we can't deliver it very fast, I mean, search me, Gov. You know what we do. <laughs> So, yeah. so just to respond to those points, so yes, in, in, a, in a, you would expect to have a, a larger level of reserves, and I think what we were hoping for when we entered the contract negotiations back in September with the trust and with providers in general was a move away from the PBR arrangement that we've got in place, which then starts to uh, at least eliminate the financial risk. Uh, that we've got, which is one of the reasons why you have to build up the reserves that, that you've got in place. So I think you're right in saying that, that the, the 21 million that's being described is almost the minimum amount. Uh, clearly, if we can get, to, we've, we've, we're working on the four million pound of unidentified, and I think we've got a session at the board uh, next in, in March, which will go through how we plan to close that gap. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we've gone some way to close it already, but. At this point in time, it will remain. Actual, I'll, I'll say it is it is four million pounds at the moment, and the key is the timing issue around the six million pounds. You're absolutely right. We we set off at the uh, beginning of January, knowing what exactly we needed to deliver in conjunction with St George's around that. We are continuing to have those negotiations. Uh, and the key will be how quickly we can articulate that in a vision and where, how soon we can get started on it. All I can say is yes, it's hugely challenging, uh, but we are continuing those negotiations with them. Uh, I guess the opportunity is that we're, 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 we both are in the same place, we're both actually working very well together. However, it will be about how quickly we can move. So I think you're right to call that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. That was a really helpful overview. Um, I think um, the, the, the taking up the theme of the threats and opportunities, I think there's a great opportunity here for collaboration. Um, and uh, you talk about the outpatients coming out of hospital, and initially that feels, oh, shouldn't they be there? But there are challenges to navigate the, this complex system so you get the right patients being seen in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, and without going from the tangent, I've trained as a GP in, in, the, in the country practice. And when I came to London, I was very amazed at how many patients were sent to hospital when I was used to seeing them. And uh, lots of elderly patients who go off to 
uh, outpatients, you know, many, many times a year, and, and actually they, they don't want to go, but they feel they have to. And it's about coordinating that and looking at models so that the patients are being seen, as you say, with the right expertise. And I'd like to pay tribute to the Kinesis system where we're able to get in contact with uh, consultants and, and get um, advice there and then rather than the patient waiting weeks on end for an outpatient appointment. So there's lots of different things that are already in place and really quite exciting. But our challenge as clinicians is to make sure that we're making sure that it's the, the patient speaks in the right place. And so that the people who really need to see the specialist face to face are seeing them and it's not well, that the people who can actually be dealt with in the community. And I think it's about the community of practice. Again, in where I was in the, as a GP in the country, you knew everyone by name and you knew your uh, local authority and so on. And in, in the future, I think we'll, we will have a better way of, of having collaboration with others and with, with the uh, collaboration with the council and the STP. Mm -hmm. So it's quite, there's a, a lot of. Um, Um, we've heard it about the ambition and it obviously clearly is. I was just wondering what your plans were about updating the board on the progress against the plans. Because obviously it's a big presentation today. How are you going to keep us in Well, I mean, I think that's for an agreement today okay. about um, you know, what, what, we, what would be helpful to bring back to board and at what point the board would be useful to the board. So I think we intend for the next meeting to bring some more of the governance around it, so how we're working with St George's and the other partners, because it's not just CCGs, it's sure. the Primary Care Federation, it's community services, it's social care, it's a, it's a So, um, so for board next time, we'll be looking at that for governance. We'll also be looking at um, some of the, the, the financial context again, so building on what Neil was saying, uh, looking at uh, the options that we have to address the immediate financial situation. Um, I, I suppose a reflection on all, all this is that so these are some priorities for this year. They kick off giving new ways of working and precedents about how things are going to be. Um, we have to recognise that um, you know, by doing things which mean that we don't pay the providers for as much work, <coughs> it's not going to help the waterfall diagram, is it really, because the land's in the provider deficit. This is about doing things differently across the system, and, and that, I think, is what the challenge is here. Um, it's almost easier to stop doing something than to actually change how we do it and do it better, really. So, so that's our challenge. So, um, in, in terms of bringing this back, though, I, I kind of do sense we need a, a, a follow-up project yeah. just of this. Yeah. So, so, where, so maybe we should, you know, we said the urgent care is coming back in, in six months. So somewhere around that time, really, I think we need a, a follow-up of this. How does this plan look in its entirety at a very high level? So if we could aim, aim for that, just to report back on each of those areas. Um, okay, that's great. Rebecca, thank you very much, and to everyone else who's putting so much work in. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going on to the prevention framework. So, Anna and um, Rinda. I'll introduce it briefly. Thank you. Um, so, this really builds on the um, collaboration theme, this time with uh, local authority and CCG. Uh, so, both of the organisations the last few years have invested uh, quite a lot of money into the voluntary community sector and also, particularly around preventative services. What we arguably haven't done is really sort of describe this in an approach, really to kind of set the foundations, set the footings, the ways of working in the future. Uh, and Anna, and I'll let, you, I'll let you guys introduce yourself in a moment, but Anna has um, helpfully worked with our clinical reference group and promoting good health to put this together, um, which I think really sort of will set the platform about how we're going to work uh, in the future. Uh, and then Amrinda, who's our self-punishment leader, you all know Amrinda, um, he will talk about some practical examples of how we're actually starting to utilise some of the foundations within the framework um, in terms of actual uh, delivery. So, I'll hand over to you guys. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so, just as a brief introduction, my name is Amrinda Sagal. I lead on patient self-management here at CCG, and I also lead the Promoting Good Health uh, CRG programme. Um, in terms of sort of the, the framework and the wider context, as the CCG has moved on to approach of working closer with the third sector and focusing on prevention. We've de developed a program where we uh, created a voluntary sector coordination project 
um, to help us focus our prevention efforts, but also to work closely uh, with the voluntary sector and make sure that there were clear lines of communication. Um, the voluntary sector knew kind of what we were aiming for as a CCG and how we could work closer together. And in order to supplement those efforts, and the CCG. Um, the idea was to be able to get around a table and have active discussions around commissioning the voluntary sector, being able to make use of community assets and working closer together. Um, as Andrew McMiller mentioned earlier, this has uh, led to us having proactive discussions and the clearest example of that is um, we're currently discussing about jointly commissioning services through the MCP. Um, this will involve working with uh, local authority and putting in a joint pot of money to look around services to do with helping uh, in elderly in the community with some handy personal services, um, helping them with potentially shopping um, and also helping them have clearer lines of um, services that they can access in the community once they've been discharged from hospital. I mean, the prevention framework very much builds on, on, on these elements and talks a lot around the person, the community, um, and other elements of such. I'm going to pass on to Anna Riley, who will be able to talk you through the framework in more detail. Thank you, Linda. And um, it's very fortuitous to follow on from the STP presentation mm -hmm. because the framework that we're working with here is very much embedded in the STP and the preventative narrative that's built into that STP. Um, so a lot of work to understand um, our joint strategic needs assessment, therefore the health and social care needs of our population across Wandsworth. And in doing that, understanding that we're very much a, a tale of two cities in Wandsworth, where we have our, our very um, young adults, um, mobile population, very well educated, etc., high employment, one of the safest boroughs, lots of assets and lots of good work that's taken place on our patch around prevention but all to recognise that there are challenges within our population as well and some of those opportunities are challenges that go hand in hand with them in terms we've got a significant regeneration programme taking place, one of the largest in Europe. We want all our residents to benefit um, from those regeneration opportunities moving forward. Um, and um, we still have significant numbers of young people living in poverty in our patch, nearly 10,000 children. Um, in understanding that, we also know that we have a number of adults who engage in unhealthy um, behaviours which are really um, driving contributory factors to many of the long-term conditions which then our health and social care services um, bear the burden of in terms of managing those services moving forwards. And that's really where a lot of the need for this prevention framework came from in terms of understanding those growth and demand on our health and social care services and how we can more effectively address that. So taking forward really um, the rhetoric that's set out in the five year forward review, a radical upgrade in prevention and understanding also um, how that's mirrored within the Care Act, we look to see what could be different about an integrated um, strategy for Wandsworth. And the element of our strategy that we think is new and is different from how we've approached this problem before is that we're very much looking to harness a whole systems approach. So we're looking at the work that takes place in Wandsworth across the place. So that is work that basically contributes to the physical environment, the physical architecture of where our residents live, work and play. And what we're looking to do there is really to build in prevention opportunities. So we want to create an environment that makes it easy for people to take the healthier choice. So to get to work easier and through active um, travel routes, um, through a safe and pleasant environment that encourages families to walk to school, um, as well as encouraging people to join parks and the open spaces. We also at the same time want to be working with our communities and we want to be developing the connectivity across our communities, the sense of cohesion, the shared understanding of problems, the shared ways of working to address those problems and how we take that forward as a part of our commissioning plans and our service developments moving forward. We also want to get a better understanding of our individual one-to-one -one services and we understand that in many ways they are the more costly part of our system and we want to develop those one-to-one -one services so that they are targeted 
at the individuals who've got the greatest capacity to benefit, which is very much some of our, our vulnerable individuals, and that we are using digital um, platforms, so those channel shift routes that referred to earlier on, and to ensure that those members of our community who benefit from those more universal approaches and those more cost-effective approaches have opportunities to access. That, in essence, is the framework that's set out. We also, in your paper, um, took the liberty of particularly mentioning some of the key areas where we feel NHS, social services, public health can work together most effectively, um, and key elements of us to work together in terms of the implementation of this framework. And they are around workforce, basically ensuring making every contact count is really embedded within the training for our frontline staff. Um, the Healthy Workplace Charter, which is embedded in Five Year Forward View as well, and um, creating the opportunity to ensure that our health, our workplaces are healthy workplaces. And if we can do that, that also increases the capacity and the capability of our frontline staff to engage in making every contact count approaches. Because if they're experiencing themselves, they're much more likely to be able to then promote it um, to their client groups. We also um, have been talking very much about developing pathways here. We need to ensure that our preventative services are much more embedded within the pathways. So when we're developing our pathways, we're also thinking very early on in the development of those pathways, what's the opportunities to prevent um, people from reaching um, the um, more intensive services within those pathways, and how have we systematically embedded that into those pathways so that every patient, every client is given the opportunity um, to benefit from those services. Um, we're also going to be um, looking at um, expanding our needs assessment um, work so that it's intelligence-led, it feeds into our commissioning plans and some of the wider regeneration programmes um, in our borough. And that very much is work that the Council will be leading in partnership with the NHS and looking to harness opportunities there to be much more joined up so the partnerships are more collaborative. And finally, um, we're going to be looking at identifying and harnessing the community activities, creating pathways to link in with health and social care. So social prescribing is one of the key areas that we want to make much more simple, much easier um, for the links between health and social care services and some of our wider community assets so that non-traditional health and social care um, services can to be more connected um, and um, less lonely and isolated. So I think that um, is a very high level overview. If there are any questions um, from the board, we'd be happy to take those questions. So um, just to say, this is a joint uh, framework. So we have been through every department and council to get them signed up to this. So it's really looking at the determinants of how to can hear housing, plan. Next week, and we are hoping to sign it off that we don't see any problems with that. So this is what's different. The other also, um, uh, kind of difference to this. We are working with neighboring CCGs to follow suit, and we think uh, I want to do, uh, yeah, other, other, uh, it's going to, to be implemented by the other CCGs in South Southwest London, at least in the, in the cluster that we are working on at the moment. So it's very much a whole system within the borough and across Southwest London as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Anna and Amrinda, for that presentation. That was really helpful. Uh, Graham. Thank you. Um, and firstly, I broadly welcome the, the framework. I think it's really a positive step forward, and it's uh, described very succinctly, which is always uh, good in terms of being able to visualise it, really. Um, but there's been a couple of themes, actually, that have run through many of our papers today, and I think it's right to kind of pose the same questions and challenge, really. So firstly, what's been the level of full community engagement, actually, in the preparation and uh, development of the framework? Um, I absolutely get the the respective agencies and authorities have been very engaged in working this up. But for this to be successful, it absolutely needs to be at the heart of communities, doesn't it, and understood and, you know, people taking it forward at a local level. And then 
the next question is about the translation of the framework into implementation. So I guess your level of confidence that the resources, the capacity, the infrastructure to make this uh, happen over the next few years is in place, or what we need to do to put it in place if it doesn't already exist. So in terms of community engagement, um, this paper came to the Youth Promoting Health CRG back in November. Um, everyone around the table had a discussion about working closely with the third sector because that's a large part of the framework. Um, so we have um, Lauren Ashley Boyle here, who is our voluntary sector coordinator, um, sponsored by WCA. Um, we worked very closely with her and so did Anna's team about um, which forums we could go to into the voluntary sector. So it has been to the voluntary sector forum, it's been to the Roehampton forum. Um, it's also uh, been to the ones of Community Empowerment Network, who have also had not a very um, opportunistic point of view in terms of being able to feed into the framework and, and being able to give their view. Um, so in terms of the community, uh, we've done our best in the time that's been allotted to, to get the views and make any changes, making sure that the third sector the communities and faith communities felt like that when it came to implementation. Um, in terms of the second question, <laughs> capacity resources, how to make it happen. Um, so, um, the work that we're now taking place is to develop that implementation plan, and it's really important that that is a, a joint implementation plan um, as we move forward. We are very much looking to do this within existing resources, as it says within the paper. So a lot of the intention of this strategy is to harness work that's already taking place and to amplify that work much more effectively than we have done um, in recent times. So say for example, we have a number of preventative initiatives um, that um, the council commissions around um, smoking cessation, grief interventions for alcohol, um, weight management, exercise referral, etc. How do we get those into patient pathways so they're systematically offered to patients? So how do we know when we've got local GPs covering practices that they're aware of their services and that they are referring patients to them? So we're starting to have conversations now to see how we can build um, this more systematically into patient pathways using DXS and um, looking at um, how we get these up onto um, the GP systems. So um, that's one element of it. It's really important that the preventative stream stays live within the STP and doesn't get forgotten about as a part of the STP. So the next piece of work that we need to do around, so the piece of work we've done has been very much around engagement. It's very much about agreeing the framework. It's the beginning of the journey. So the piece of work around implementation, we now need to agree what the government's framework is going to be for the prevention framework. Um, that really needs to be reported back at quite a high level within both organisations. So we're having those conversations in the council now. We would need to have them with the CCG, who will be the overseeing body for this. And the implementation plan we need to develop, that needs to be co-production. We don't want to just engage with our um, voluntary sector and communities, but very much the tip of the iceberg. So we need to take that forward now in a much more detailed way. So we're working with the Health and Wellbeing Board on the 21st of February um, at their seminar to agree and identify um, priority areas. We'll be taking this back and checking it out, and then we will be bringing an implementation plan back to the CCG Council um, for agreement. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so thank you. It's, it's an aligned point, I think, about implementation it picks up on Stephen's question about the wider STP. So, I know really, particularly with prevention, what we're interested in is outcomes. But because outcomes are you know, perhaps a multi-year um, and quite hard to measure, sometimes we do focus on the inputs as well. So uh, with things like making every contact count, which I think is a fantastic idea, a fantastic way of getting messages across, how, how will we be able to measure how many we're doing now and then how many more we're, we're able to deliver and as a proxy for the kind of impact we're hoping it will have? So making every contact count is, is a very key one, as you say, in terms of engaging um, the whole of our workforce and making opportunities. Some of the proxy measures we're using um, for counting at the moment is we're trialling various ways of working. So we're doing some um, more in-depth work at the moment with discrete groups. So there's something we're trialling with housing census 
you go out into the community and see a lot of um, people on the face-to-face basis. We're trying some half-day training with them, and then we're looking at the impact that has on referrals into other services as our proxy <coughs> measure. We're also trialling um, as well some e-learning packages and looking at ways of getting that into service specifications and contracts. Mm-hmm. So issues like winter war, like loneliness and isolation, um, and then what we're looking to see again is the number of people who go online to want to take that training, and again the impact on referrals into organisations. So they're the types of proxy measures that we're using at this point in time. Um, just sort of two points. The first one is uh, an observation really from the last three months. Um, if you look at the place element really, which is around policy, so you know policy around restricting fast food outlets near schools, that is something as Huda said that you just can't get agreement in overnight. It takes time. It takes a lot of challenging and resisting practice, perhaps across the council and across the NHS, and in different ways of working, really start to challenging challenging that from the public health. level of engagement internally as much as externally that's needed to kind of get this up and running and off the ground. I think the second point from the CTG's perspective um, is in the last three months we've seen, I think, closer working on the preventative side, um, not just with Anna, but with other colleagues in the council as well, you think you clearly the influence, around trying to come together with us and look at how we are commissioning and commissioning preventative services in different ways. So rather than the historic NHS approach of you know, putting something up on contracts, finder and, you know, whoever writes the best wins, it's really now a different approach in working with um, Lauren and WCA about saying we've got 1,400 voluntary fringe groups in Wandsworth, how can we best use their power, their knowledge as much as possible and really trying to do this prevention approach in a different way of working and I think that's it's early days but it seems to be starting to filter its way through. So thank you. Um, thank you and again I think it's very good paper and I like the, the three, the, the, the diagram, I thought first that was very complicated but I looked at it and I thought it was really very helpful so thank you. I had two specific questions. Um, one is on place. Um, I seem to recall in the Health and Wellbeing Board some time ago the, this, this issue came up about concept, exactly what you said, you know, about bringing together resources um, in a much more coordinated way and getting more bang for the aggregate buck and there was a particular focus in that that time on the Roehampton regeneration and I wondered if you could say about how that is going because it's a little while but that, that was sort of piloting exactly what you were saying I think one of the reasons for focusing on Roehampton was a because Roehampton mattered in its own terms but also a sense that in terms of capability and capacity it would be better to do these things you know intensely in one area rather than sort of spread it very thinly and I, is that still so the one question <coughs> that. my second question um, it doesn't really figure here um, and I want to ask whether it should, and that's about air quality. I mean, it's implicitly there. But there's been a lot of stuff recently. Is there a fourth one down the left hand side of the place? Is it? Okay. Traffic, traffic calming. Uh, okay, sorry, okay, well, I, I would. I would anyway, my, my real. Sorry, it is there, I beg your pardon. But the word I was really looking for was diesel in this context. Um, and the worst measure, I realise that measuring isn't comprehensive across London, so certain areas appear and so on and so forth, but nonetheless Putney is, is very bad. Um, I'm conscious also that the council is taking a very, very proactive approach across, I realise this issue isn't just local, it's clearly you know, London-wide, query national, so it's not solvable, I guess, you know, narrow, Wandsworth uh, way, but the council is being very proactive um, in exactly such an issue around aircraft noise. Um, you know, he's putting a lot of resources and political energy and money, frankly, into campaigning against aircraft noise over, over this bit of London. And I wondered about whether it is similarly engaging on the question of diesel emissions in mm. particular, which clearly goes beyond the boundaries of Wandsworth itself, although it's very acute in Wandsworth, and whether, you know, it's genuine questions, so what, what is the council actually doing on this and how active is it really being? I can take this for um, If I start with the air quality, it's an extremely high priority for the council. And, uh, and earlier, 
Putney High Street and lobbying to have like less polluting buses, analysis of starting the work in Roehampton, in, uh, in Tooting and in Battersea. And indeed there is a meeting of the ones with Environment Forum on the 16th of February that I'm speaking at on, on, um, on air quality. And just as it happens, I'm the London Direct Public Health Lead on air quality. So I'm championing this, not only within the borough, but what, how we can influence the mayor's uh, kind of uh, quality, uh, air quality plan. I think of particular importance for us around diesel. The, the, the mayor is quite right trying to implement clean zones. You know, if he does, he does want to do this, cover the whole of London or shift the problem mm. to the peripheries. So it can go on for other uh, air quality. We've been taking it very, very seriously, and but both personally as a borough and, and across London. Regarding Roehampton as well, uh, I'm glad um, uh, Andy mentioned the kind of the time and scale it takes. When you're looking at the place and the wider determinants, sometimes it takes a period of time. So. If Outlets, we have actually achieved that, and we were challenged nationally by the inspector, and he, he ruled in our favour because we've done it right and we provide the evidence. But this takes time, and with Roehampton, we're trying to embed the work with the regeneration work. So it's not like you know we see social part of the physical. Um, so you, as you know, also the kind of I think we are in a kind of standstill period until we are able to tell who the developer will be, and we'll be working hand in glove with them around the engagement, etc. However, we haven't just been sitting on our hands around the Hampton. Uh, we have commissioned uh, over kind of recurrently 11 projects that have reached two and a half thousand people around health improvement. We have a, a child health and equality uh, program that we're working closely with the CCG. My claim is with our steering group, and this is targeting children that are not engaging in children's centres, and two of the centres are in Roehampton. Uh, festival, the Roehampton festival, etc., and so on. And working indeed around the kind of whenever we can with colleagues in the CCG when services are not targeting that they are targeting. So through the public health board we audited the smoking cessation service to make sure it's reaching the right people and it is. And also we have seen significant improvements for example in NHS checks through active interventions by the CCG to make sure we're working together to improve these outcomes. So there's a lot happening and maybe we need to get better at telling the story to start with and also to understand how we are system Systematically embedding this in the regeneration program. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, but I think we need to um, wind up there. Um, so, so, the purpose of bringing this was really so that we could you know, consider input, understand where it's coming from, and, um, and then we can get it to the Health and Wellbeing Board, and we're already partners in that. So, um, so I hope that's achieved its purpose from that point of view of kind of you know, socialising it really. But, it, but from a CCG point of view, what we now need to do is is kind of use it in yeah. whatever we're doing. So, I, so are you going to make a suggestion yeah, so that I don't have to think of something? Go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're bringing it back to the board uh, time after next, which is in May, yeah. uh, our actual implementation plan, which will obviously include, this is the foundation block, but include kind of everything we're doing we want to do around community resilience, self-management, patient empowerment, um, social prescribing as well. So there's a lot of different things that we're doing. Echo uh, Ruda's comments that we probably need to get better at telling the story of this because there's a lot of good yeah. stuff and, and I think that will it starts with this and then we'll bring it back again in May for implementation. Yeah, okay. So so yes and I think whenever we're thinking about the, the kind of you know the big issues that need to be embedded throughout, you know, the principles of you have clinical commissioning and everything, you have patient input into everything, and actually you have a prevention angle in everything. And so that's what we need to do. So when our planned care board is meeting, they need to be mindful of this in all of the work streams and ask the question, so where's where's this happening when they're looking at you know challenging themselves really. So that's where we need to get to with this. So that I think if you could build that yeah. into our governance as well. That's the beginning. Yeah, good. Great, thank you. Thank you both Aninda and, um, and Anna for presenting today. That's excellent. Very good. So uh, let's move on to um, uh, management reports. So on the executive report, any questions or comments on those on that report?
report. Neil, do you want to uh, just take us into this? I know you've got a few things to say. Yes, yeah, so I'll, again, I'll just split it into two and I'll be as, uh, as brief as I can. I assume that you've all read the report, so I'll just pick out the headlines um, that we've got. So taking 16.17 first, uh, we're actually on target to achieve the surplus. Uh, we're behind on the quick target uh, in the region of about two and a half million, uh, and we are expecting to meet our running costs. To note on uh, slide five, uh, the allocation that we've received for primary care access, so we're hosting on behalf of South West London, so we've received all the money in. That money will go out to the other CCGs, but that's the short, just short of £1 million that we talked about earlier in the urgent care presentation. So that's what we're doing. There is a plan for that money to be spent. position in line with the previous month, but to note there was quite a significant change in month eight from the previous month with St George's. Now some of that is largely um, not, it's not to be, it's not unexpected, we do expect to change, but it was a bit, it was above the run rate that we would expect. So at this point in time we've not changed the forecast because we did build some flexibility into that acute position, but clearly we're going to need to keep an eye on that trend um, certainly over month nine and month ten just to see whether that is a step change uh, in place. In terms of primary care, uh, so overall a break-even position, uh, we've received some an allocation again to cover for 15-16 accruals that NHS England has the uh, commission previously just to cover those costs. There was some additional allocation that we actually got from them to cover some of the emerging pressures uh, that could be there, so we're not entirely sure whether they'll materialise, so these were specifically around uh, their quit plan, um, and also there was uh, some locum cover that was within the primary care position, so we should have enough money in that position to cover primary care overall. Prescribing continues to be an area where we are seeing some underperformance coming through and that's continued in this month as well. So on slide 12 there's a recovery plan uh, slide uh, which really just shows uh, on the table 1 that really shows you the, the overall position that we've got to <coughs> there, so where the, uh, the risks and the mitigations are in place. Table two really was about what, so on the real downside scenario, if everything went against us, how would we actually mitigate and would we have enough mitigations in place? And what that now has started to show is that actually we're, we're now in a position where we're slightly uh, into a surplus position here, so we actually have more mitigations than risk. However, to note the acute position that I've referred to is one we'd need to keep an eye on, so I certainly would not want us to. Um, not to keep the focus on this area and to continue with the action plan which has been a sub which has been successful and is scrutinised in detail at the Finance and Resources Committee as well as the Financial Recovery Group which CCG has put in place. But that's that's good work but we can't uh, rest on our laurels at the moment. So I'll pause there if there's anything around sixteen seventeen anybody wants to ask me any question. Good. Okay. Thank you. So really just on 1719 planning, so just to give you an update on uh, where we got to so submit both the operating and financial plan as well as uh, getting all our contracts signed and they would be our local contracts. So the good news was that we did manage to sign all the contracts and get those agreed. But as you've seen in earlier presentations, uh, specifically around the STP, there is an affordability issue in terms of the quip. So at the moment, the quip that's been taken out of the contract for St George's is around about 50%. So we need to obviously push that up to the 100%, and that then would be in line with the quip plan that we've got in place. Uh, in terms of the financial plan that we submitted, um, previously I think I told the board that we were holding a break-even, in-year break-even position, uh, which meant that we would be only delivering a half a percent cumulative surplus, which is not in line with the business rules. Uh, NHS England continued to push on that, saying they expected all the CCGs uh, to actually get to the 1% business rules. 
So what we've done is we've moved that position in this final submission, noting all the risks around achieving that, and obviously as we've been talking about in terms of the quip and the overall quip. So that's why the, the quip plan has gone up slightly from uh, what was being talked about previously, so around about 20 million, it's up to 21 million, and there have been some other areas where we've ended up where the money's come, come back into the right side. But the key point is we're delivering business rules uh, based on the financial plan. a control total for South West London uh, and at this point in time based on the submissions that the six South West London CCGs have put in uh, we're not hitting that control total we're about five million pounds off that that total so we should be achieving a 4.6 million pound surplus across the six of us at the moment we're at a, a break-even position or just slightly uh, under that so work is continuing with NHS England and with the CCGs in uh, addressing that position. At the moment we're holding the line that we have done more than enough in trying to get us to just meeting the business rules and for us to take that any further is going to be hugely challenging. But obviously that conversation will continue. So any questions? Stephen? That last point, that already assumes I thought I was right, pretty heroic assumption by some of our neighbouring CCGs. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And in our neighbouring CCG, their percentage of the quip, uh, of their allocation, is, is actually more than ours. So if you think ours is a challenging quip programme, theirs is even more challenging. Um, and in actual fact, when one of the, the issues is, when we talk about gross quip and net quip, so the net quip being where you've got investment, you actually scratch beneath the surface and see that actually some of our neighbouring CCGs have got actually very low investments, which is just not realistic. So there's many, many uh, factors in play here, but hugely challenging across the uh, sector. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can I? So <coughs> if, I mean, I realise this is obviously to mention here, if, uh, if, for the sake of argument, we were able to deliver what we've said here, <coughs> but one or more of our neighbours couldn't, what is the implication of the new control total regime potentially for Wandsworth? So, so I don't know for absolute certainty here, but I suspect we would effectively be putting the economy into a financial recovery situation. And then that's what, what that's what it would mean. So it, the fact that we're hitting our business rules and maybe two of the other five are as well, but if overall we're not achieving we're not collectively achieving, they may put us into financial recovery as, a, as an economy. Mm. Okay, anything else to ask on this? Okay, well, thank you very much. We have some summary minutes from uh, the committees of the board, so from Integrated Governance, from the Finance Resource Committee and from the Audit Committee. Anyone want to say anything on those? Very good, thank you. And do we have any <coughs> business from the board? Okay, thank you. Is there um, anybody, members of the public, who would like to ask a question or make a comment, on, particularly on the agenda items today? Uh, Malik. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. Um, just picking up on the conversation around the prevention frameworks mm. and the conversations around the SDP comments that we made from, from members of the board. Um, yes, indeed, there's been a lot of uh, conversations and, and, and dialogue, and, which has been very open. It's been very refreshing in terms of the amount of opportunities we've had for engagement and, 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 and for conversation. And I think, it's, I think it's fair to say that in those conversations, uh, either with the community and power network or out in the voluntary sector and voluntary sector board, that there has been a robust and critical challenge of the prevention framework. It hasn't just been a fait accompli. There's been a number of questions, challenges, to say, is this the right priority? Is this the right direction? There's also been, um, and I think it's fair to say, a little bit of disquiet in relation to the amount of collaboration that has gone on. 
Um, and I'm talking about deep collaboration. You know, how do we come up with commissioning targets? Do commissioners do it for themselves? Or do we do it together? Who's in the room when we decide outcome? And there's been an element of um, um, frustration that it hasn't been as effective as it potentially can be. Um, I think the more broader point is when colleagues like you and others talk about the whole system, I think Ray mentioned this point. Of course, the whole system is not just institutions. And um, a lot of the conversations around the prevention framework is essentially institutional based. We'll get our institutions to do things in a much better way. And I think the institutions are actually only part of the whole system. And in terms of how people live and operate, increasingly the institutions play less of a part in, in people's lives. And I think one of the terms that was mentioned about, you know, we need a radical upgrade in prevention. And I share Stephen's um, comment that actually we need to, it's a fundamental and radical change. And one of the concerns that we have is you need a new set of relational tools in order to do that. Even the voluntary sector, which is very much on the front line of engagement with the communities, even they struggle and find it difficult to understand what these new relational tools are around co-production, around network science. Parallel. And I think part of the problem, uh, part of the challenge with the prevention framework is we still haven't made that leap of imagination, a leap of intelligence, and a leap in terms of understanding the science of relationships. So I think that if we are going to um, have that radical point in prevention, and, and, and like I said, going back to what Stephen said, it's a fundamental change. And I think at the moment, a lot of the conversations around the prevention framework, some of them around the SDP, has still not grasped the change that is required and the new set of tools and requirements that are required. So um, I'm concerned and um, um, that we're yet not at a point. And a lot of things are happening. We're going to have the welcoming board, decisions to be made by you know, certain milestones this year, when I don't think we've actually embraced the wider set of relationships and tools that we yet uh, need to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, do you know how to do that? I think there's a change of culture that is required. I think it's happening already. I think colleagues like Anna and Arinda and others are making more of an attempt, yourself as well, Nicola, to come out into communities and have those conversations. But I think it only happens at a piecemeal basis. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen as much as it should happen. There's not enough people in decision-making positions within our institutions who are willing to go out and have those relationships. I think the next challenge is that when they have those conversations, how are they taking those conversations back into the institutions? And how are those conversations in the institutions then changing the culture of the institutions? This is not an easy problem. It's not just a one to problem. It's something that we've you know, been in the literature for many, many years. But I think those are part of the challenges about decision makers being more visible in their relationships with key people in the community, and there are key people in the community who are not necessarily voluntary sector organisations. Mm -hmm. They exist in different types of networks um, across the borough. A lot of those leaders are not in a peer-to-peer -peer arrangement with other decision makers. So I think there's a challenge there about going out much more. Mm -hmm. I think there's a challenge there about how do institutions learn. There was a phrase about 10 years ago about institutions becoming learning organisations. And I think there's a challenge about us being so pressurized in relation to what's coming down the pipeline and what we need to deliver that we forget that we need to learn. Quite often we talk about voluntary sector and community groups need to learn about how to be more resilient, but there is something about our institutions and our institutions also learning more. And I don't think we do that as much. No, so Monica, I, I think it's a timely reminder to us actually because you know you can sense the intense pressure that the board and the organisation and the system is under to to perform and deliver uh, with less money to do more 
and um, and I think we all should remember that actually it, the kind of personal impact that we can have and the impact as an organisation can you know have much more reach if we if we do get out more. So I think I think that's a really important message. I don't think we'll crack the issue that you're you know trying to help us crack, but but we need to remember not to be too inward focused when we're doing all of this. So thank you. Can I just want to take this one? I always value your colleagues, and we, we can always challenge, we challenge us now, like, and we can put in our thinking about friends. But also, it's about telling the story again. I think, you know, in terms of engagement and co production, every one of us around this table is playing the role. None, none of us is doing Absolutely, no one else does that and does it so well. The community sector, you know, deals with certain voluntary groups. You deal with patient participation groups, and also you remember, and the local authority, there are elected members from both sides of the politics that are engaging with people day in, day out, and they are scrutinising what we are doing. They are feeding back their experiences, what they are seeing in surgeries, and this is all again complements the story. So I think you know, whilst I totally kind of listen to what you're saying, and I think it's important. It's about the science of working, but also it's about also not beating ourselves up for not doing it. We, we're doing our best and we do more, but also there is a, a considerable amount of engagement in its own way in various organizations. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. My question is that we are overspending on the emergency in, in emergency and this minister and guidance and promises for art bar hospitals. And Chelsea and the Minister, uh, a &E is very small. It can't not hold any patient. I've been there, and I know they're not very good. Um, I'm not sure about guys in hospital at all, but I know that St. George's a &E is excellent. As you go in, there are three cubicles, and the doctors and doc nurses are standing there to check them first before they go to a &E and they send straight away children for a and pregnancy will be straight through. And why are we not sending any emergency patient to St. George's? I've got no idea. But why we aren't spend, sending no, more? No. Sending more. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. Yes, I mean, you must yourself, so clearly, in, in <coughs> emergency departments are the, the the place where patients choose to go. So we, you know, we can perhaps influence that to an extent, but I, I'm not sure it's our role to do that. Um, people choose where they want to go for their emergency care. Is this, you know, is there something on the finances of it that, that we need to? Understand that? No, no, I would say it is. It's down to patient choice. On page um, eight, if you read it, it says quite openly that we are sending less patient to St George's. We are on maternity. We are sending them, but not on any. We are sending them to. So we are sending on page eight. If you have a look, yeah. you, you realise what I'm talking about. But I think what Nicola's saying is that it, it, this is a result of what patients have chosen to go to these hospitals. It's not all sending them to these hospitals. We are sending more on to um, helping the patients. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the patient. So all, all we, the yeah, all we do is pay when pay patients attend at, at the emergency department. We don't have much control over it. We just put the bill for that, I'm afraid. So yeah. that's what our, a lot of our plans are trying to influence. So thank you very much for that question. I'm going to wrap us up now because we've each time. And we've got some written questions that we had submitted to the board, which we will respond to in writing um, as usual. Um, but thank you very much uh, for the board this morning. You've worked hard. And thank you to people who uh, attended and are interested. Much appreciate it. We're going to move on to a part two now. So if people would move on out relatively quickly, that would be appreciated. Thank you.